Uh, this is Bruce Stein. I've been a patent attorney for about 30 years. Uh, this is Patent Law 101 for Inventors and Scientists, Part 2. Part 2 will be talking about getting U.S. patents, which is probably the part that's going to be of most interest to those of you. The important statutory requirements for obtaining a patent are set forth in Title 35 United States Code. In particular, that the invention be novel or new, useful and non-obvious. These are the three that are most famous and most important. In addition, we will also look at the requirement that you teach one skill in the art how to make and how to use the invention, as well as disclosing the best mode. Those three requirements are set forth in 35 U.S. Code, Section 112, Paragraph 1. The subject matter of your invention must be novel or new. In the United States, you have a one-year grace period should you make it public uh, before you file your provisional application. However, outside of the United States, there is no grace period that require absolute novelty. Therefore, it's very important not to make public disclosures before the provisional application is filed. Novelty is a very, very fine line, and it is usually what, why many scientists who have good, good inventions and patentable inventions miss them. For instance, chairs with three, four, and five legs are old. Now, a chair with six legs, probably novel. Aspirin is old. A new crystal form of aspirin would be novel. Cars have had engines in front and in back, and that's all. But probably underneath would be novel. Process that works and has been known and is public is a known process. If you make a modification of that process, that is an improvement and it's novel. Section 101 involves utility. Utility is almost never a problem the U.S. patent application. There is no requirement to explain how or why your invention works, and I recommend you do not. Novelty just means your invention is new. It does not necessarily mean it will be patentable. Inventions must meet both standards, that it's novel and not obvious. So an invention must be novel under Section 102 and must also be not obvious under Section 103. This is why a six-legged chair, even though it is novel, will not be patentable because it is obvious. The third requirement of the most important three is Section 103 dealing with obviousness. Usually if there's a problem in obtaining a U.S. patent, it is here. The first question is, what does the prior art teach one skilled in the art about your invention? And then second, what is surprising and unexpected about your invention in view of the prior art? It is the surprising and unexpected properties or results of your invention that gives the factual basis for the legal conclusion of non-obviousness. In cases where your invention solves a problem, that in and of itself, the ability to solve a problem that other things cannot take care of, usually will take care of the obviousness requirement and get your patent. In the United States, this is, as I mentioned, this is what we call obviousness. Outside of the United States, the same issue is referred to as inventive step. And when your application is rejected, it will be for lack of inventive step. Here's an example dealing with the issue of non-obviousness. It is known that there's an AIDS drug called the Laverdine mesolate. It is known originally in crystal form E. Subsequent to that, another party took made the same drug, which is the lavadine, the same salt, the mesolate salt, but produced two different crystal forms. These crystal forms were identified as crystal forms S and T. The issue here was, is this obvious? It certainly was new, but the question is whether it is obvious. Crystal form E was hydroscopic, which meant it picked up water. Crystal forms S and T were not hydroscopic, and therefore they had a surprising and unexpected property, and therefore were non-obvious and patentable. How do inventors usually get patents? The procedure is as follows. The first step usually is conception, which is the idea or the thinking part of the invention, and it should be properly recorded in your research notebook. The second step 
is reducing the invention to practice. This is the doing part. And once it is reduced to practice, the third step that most uh, inventors and scientists undertake is to file a provisional patent application. And this is what we will call time zero. Uh, one year later, the PCT or Patent Cooperation Treaty application is filed. This allows you to file one application and yet hold uh, the availability to file patent applications in all other countries at a subsequent date. Uh, the PCT application is published at 18 months. Continuing with the process of how scientists and inventors usually get patents. At approximately 16 months, you will receive a search report and a written opinion. Uh, this allows you a chance to amend the claims uh, within two months of that report. Sometime after this, we will get to a period of after two years, approximately 26, 27 months, at which time you will have to make a decision on where you want the application filed as far as foreign countries. It is at this point that most small businesses and individual inventors license out the invention. By this point, somewhere 26, 27 months, you probably will have invested somewhere between seven and fifteen thousand dollars in the invention. It will have given you over two years to improve the invention and try and bring it to marketability and sell or license it to a third party. At this point, once you make the decision which countries you begin want the application filed in, the uh, finances on this increase uh, quite rapidly. The reason is you need translations for most foreign countries. You can do Europe all in one language. Uh, this is an alternate procedure which can be used in filing your patent application in certain uh, circumstances. As you recall, uh, just previously, I said the usual procedure is the conception of the invention, then the doing in the laboratory, which is the reduction to practice, and finally the filing of a provisional patent application. One way to look at why this uh, alternative procedure can be very important is what if two or more inventors file for the same invention at approximately the same time? In the United States, the one that will get the patent is the one that invented first, the first one to invent. And this is determined by a legal proceeding called an interference. For the rest of the world, the one that filed first is the one that gets the invention. And that is very simple. You just line up the patent applications, look at the filing dates, and the first to file wins. Now, if we go back and look at the requirements for patentability, under Section 112, Paragraph 1, there were two requirements. You had to teach one's skill in the art how to make the invention, and also teach one's skill in the art how to use the invention. And you will notice there's absolutely no requirement to have made the invention. Therefore, since all that you have to do is teach one skill in the art how to make and use the claimed invention, you can Following your conception, you can go file a provisional patent application, then go in the laboratory and do the work. I hope this program has helped you resolve issues you have as far as your invention and whether you want to file a patent application and how to do so. I strongly suggest that you not try to file one yourself. But if you have questions and you wish to move forward, please contact a patent attorney and they will be more than pleased to help you and have the expertise to do so. Good luck to all of you.